45, verses 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise to the evil and the good, and sends rain to the righteous and unrighteous. If you love those who love you, that will reward what reward will you get? And not even the tax collectors doing that. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. In his theological dictionary, entitled Whistling in the Dark, and he goes through words A through Z that talk about faith and God and um, different things, pastor and writer, one of my favorite writers, Frederick Beekner, has the following definition for the word he put in his dictionary, enemy. Here's his definition. You see the lines on their faces and the way they walk when they're tired. You see who their wives and husbands are, maybe. You see where they're vulnerable. You see where they're scared. Seeing what is hateful about them, you may catch a glimpse of where that hatefulness comes from. Seeing the hurt they cause you, you may also see the hurt they cause themselves. You're still light years away from loving them, to be sure, but at least you see how they are human, even as you are human. Wow, it wasn't my definition of enemy. My definition of enemy was um, one who feels very self-righteous when she knows she's been harmed or treated unfairly, and she has every reason to think hateful thoughts. That's in my dictionary. But boy, Frederick Beekner challenges us to do that differently. The Ethan read the um, New International Version of the Scripture today, I want to share with you the message version, which is a modern version. It's not a translation, but it's a, it's a, a, a version. Um, I'm going to go back to some verses before um, what Ethan read. Jesus is, is speaking, and he says, here's another old saying that deserves a second look. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Is that going to get us anywhere? Jesus says, here's what I propose. Don't hit back at all. If someone strikes you, stand there and take it. If someone drags you into court and sues you for your shirt, gift wrap your best coat and mail that to them. And if someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more tit for tat, Jesus says. Live generously. Live generously. The Old Testament said um, vengeance was okay as long as it was vertical, like an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You couldn't go beyond that, but you could. It was okay to return what was done to you. And I remember when I was um, I don't know, two or three years old, and we lived north of Memphis, Tennessee, in a little town, Dyersburg, and we had a neighbor boy, um, and yes, in Tennessee, his name was Bubba, and, <laughs> and he was my friend, um, one of the neighbor kids I played with, but he could also be me, and he um, just one time just came right out and bit me on the arm hard. And I ran home and 
told my mom. And mom took me by the hand and we marched over to Bubba's house and she knocked on the door and she told, asked his mother to come out. She said, see what your son did to my daughter's arm? And then she said, Kathy, I want you to bite Bubba back really hard. And I couldn't do, I, that just, I couldn't do that. Um, and I'm glad I didn't, but it's just something I remember that stayed with me. Um, but that doesn't mean that I don't have times, many times, where people I don't, who have hurt me or, or, or have harmed me in some way or I resent or, um, you know, who just rough, make me mad or whatever, that I have thought, you know, boy, I'd like to get even or... I, I have those thoughts, so not biting Bubba wasn't a cure for those thoughts, um, but I'm glad I didn't bite him. I love the words in that message version, live generously. What does that, that mean, to live generously? Well, my take on it, at least today, is that it means don't hold back. Even when the world is telling you, you know, hold back or, or don't um, be nice to those uh, who are mean to you or harmful, don't hold back. Don't hold back what God wants us to do, which is to love and pray for those people. Now, the verses that um, Ethan read get a little bit more interesting in the message version. Jesus says, now, you're familiar with the old written law, love your friends, or love your neighbors, what it says in Leviticus. And it's unwritten companion, love your, hate your enemy. But Jesus says, I'm challenging you. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you not the worst. Hmm. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the energies of prayer. For then you are working out of your true selves, your God-given identity. That's what God does. God gives God's best. The sun to warm and the rain to nourish to everyone, regardless of who they are good and bad, nice and nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, Jesus says, well, what do you expect, a bonus? What it said right there. If you expect a bonus, that's in the message version. Anybody can do I expect a bonus, yeah. But anybody can do that, Jesus said. Any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. In a word, Jesus says, what I'm saying is grow up. Your kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others. The way God lives toward you. It's always easier to love a person that we know or like or share similar interests to ours. But Jesus doesn't call us to do the easy thing. Jesus calls us to discipleship. And that means not just mingling with people um, in, a, in a safe, protective way that isn't too much trouble for us, but it means embracing the other. Not necessarily physically, not hugging our enemies, but praying for them, noticing their humanness, knowing that they are as human as we are, and respecting even when they wish us ill or do things that are just so painful, wishing them God's good and respecting their, that they are also created in the image of God and to pray for them even if we can't yet forgive them or talk to them or be with them, but we can pray for them and we can notice their hum humanness, their humanity. The Christian life is not a passive one where Jesus says, 
um, well, you know, if you're comfortable, then do what feels comfortable. Jesus calls us to a life of discipleship that is very active and intentional and hard. And to love our enemy means seeing God in the other, the enemy. God sets no bounds in loving. God doesn't say, well, love this person, but you don't have to love that person. If we stay inside where we're comfortable, then the hate that's in the world is going to continue and it's going to grow. So see others as God sees them, which we have been celebrating at baptisms. You know, you are God's beloved child. You are precious. Let me read some more from that definition um, of enemy in the, that dictionary, Whistling in the Dark. <coughs> Frederick Beekner goes on with the definition. Let's see. I'm step on my page. Um, I knew I should number these pages. I knew I should. I need a language for this. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, let's see. Here we go. As Beekner writes, um, okay, oh boy, I'm going to number my pages from now on. Um, Hold on. Jesus says we are to love our enemies and pray for them, meaning love them not in the emotional, warm and cuddly, you know, touchy-feely sense, but in the sense of willing their good, which is the sense in which Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself and love God with your heart, soul, and mind. Jesus calls us to will, to pray for, to want their good. Jesus knows that we're all going to have enemies. And Lord knows we may be somebody's enemy and not even know it. And there's no reassurance from Jesus. Jesus doesn't say in these verses that, and by praying and loving your enemy, you're going to transform their lives and transform the world and all will be good. We don't know that that's going to happen, but we're still supposed to do it. We're still, still supposed to love and pray for those who seem against us. And why? Because we are the children of God. I'm not saying we should allow ourselves or those we love, our, our children, to be abused or bullied. I'm not saying we should encourage someone to uh, keep going in, or continue in their evil behavior. But what if I just take a step back and think about them as human, as people who uh, may, maybe there's something going on, a brokenness, a, a being troubled, um, a, a hurt I don't know about, a, a lifelong struggle, or mental illness, a, a loved one who is sick in their life, a relationship that is broken. And maybe they're taking it out on, on us. And we can you know, do my definition, which is I'm justified to think mean and hateful thoughts because they're being harmful or mistreating me. And instead, go to Frederick Beekner's definition. Um, I wonder what's going on in their life. What's going on underneath that I may not know about? I at least can pray for this person. I can at least pray for them. And I can ask God to heal whatever is broken and hurting and vulnerable in their life. Now our behavior that kind of behavior may not have any effect on the other person. They may not change at all. But I guarantee it will have an effect on me and you and all of us who, who are able to do this. The message version of the words that Ethan read to us earlier say, grow up, your kingdom's 
subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously from your heart, especially for those people you're uncomfortable with. That's the life that Jesus calls us to live, and that's the possibility that we are created for. Amen.